Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. It's Friday, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. You made it through another week. I want to start off this episode, not on a somber note, but uh, unfortunately we had a member of our tool community, our tool family uh, creator, uh, had passed away uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, his name is Mike. You might have known him by his uh, Man Cave was his uh, title of his uh, channel. And Mike was a great guy. Um, he's from New Zealand. Uh, a lot of you have uh, subscribed with my uh, recommendation a long time ago. He had uh, he only did about 21 videos, uh, but he had, uh, you know, 1,500 subscribers or whatever. His uh, channel was really getting up there. Then it was hacked by somebody, and but he, uh, he continued. He got the, the content back. And I have to tell you something. Uh, it's always sad when we lose somebody that... Uh, as an influence on us. And Mike was a natural when it came to uh, restoring tools, but even more so, his real talent and skill and love was in videography and, uh, and photography. And if you look at any of his videos, which I encourage you to do, go over and check out some of his work and, and look at it, you'll be inspired. And uh, hopefully you'll pick up a couple tips and tricks from his, uh, his, beautiful video work and i know we all have a lot of us have uh we're gonna miss him but uh let's not be uh sad about it let's celebrate his work and his uh his efforts and uh, keep his channel going and uh like i said condolences to him to his family to uh his wife who's uh you know going through a difficult time with this but uh you know we're all heading in the same spot and uh, we'll meet up again one day Okay, let's get started. Uh, last week we did the uh, vacuum cleanup that I found on the poor man's flea market. And I said, you know, I got this cool little chrome vacuum upstairs in the attic. And uh, I went upstairs to show you this. I didn't find it. I know it's up there. I just don't know where it is just now. But I found some something else I think you might find pretty interesting. Let's check that out. Okay, over here, this was a lot of my dad's tools that he used to restore vintage hi-fi he used to love the old hi-fi, and a lot of this he used to use here. And a friend of his passed away at a very early age. Actually, he was walking at night like I do and was hit by a car. And uh, my dad wound up getting, this guy had a ton of tools and things like that, all snap-on, you know. So I have, you know, a lot of that stuff up here, and I, I usually don't use that stuff. But underneath here, there was a box, and there was a small vacuum in it, and in here... Let's check out, oh, check out some of these. Now, these were some of his catalogs. And when I was a kid, I would look through these. Uh, look at this, these old Lafayette catalogs. You remember these? When I was a kid and just getting into radio and CBs and eventually ham radio, these were the catalogs that were... Let me show you these uh, old Lafayette. Okay, years ago, there used to be, uh, you know, you've heard of Radio Shack. Well, Lafayette was a, a radio electronics store. They were out of Syosset, Long Island was their uh, headquarters. But I think they were pretty much known around, uh, you know, in, in a greater area here. But they had all kinds of electronics. This catalog, the corners ripped off, but I believe it's from the late 60s. This one here is 1970, that catalog. And you could see what it was, these catalogs, they were a lot of electronics and tools and things like that in here. Um, my father was basically into uh, high fidelity speakers. And so he'd be looking through this for tubes and and uh, and and speakers and what and radios were coming into big time back then. You could see here. But let me show you that the 70 catalog, because I think I remember this one as a kid myself looking through this. And it was always in. They had so many things, especially in the back, you know, like remember Citizens Band was came into its big thing back in 1976. And you can remember they started off with 23 channels and then went to 40 channels. I don't know if you remember that, but um, look at that price, $199 for a 23 channel radio. And this is back in $1970, which was, you know, you could buy a lot of stuff, but they had such cool looking uh radios and you know they they some of the more popular stuff they would put in the color section you could see here just beautiful looking radios and again they were pricey you know that was a lot of money back then at least 
maybe a week's salary or something for a radio like this or something. So uh, I was into the CB radios back in the mid 70s and whatnot, but they also had all kinds of uh, testers and and regular radios. And look at this, even like mini bikes. Who didn't want a mini bike when we were kids, you know? Oh, yeah, these were we used to call these rups. Um, and you know, this was just a, basically like a Briggs and Stratton motor with a little centrifugal clutch and, and we used to drive these things around and that was, they were illegal, you know, <laughs> to have in the city like everything else, but you would always try to, you know, get one to get your parents to get one. Remember antennas that went on the roof for, for, uh, television. Remember there was a TV, every roof had a TV antenna, one of these type of antennas. Some still do that they haven't taken it down. Um, again, like I said, this was, they, they had a bunch of different, Lafayette was a, a good uh, a store. It was a kind of a step above Radio Shack. Here's our Black & Deck uh, section over here. You see over here, the Black & This is where they started to hybrid between the plastic grips, you know, and... Uh, I, they had, you know, different tools and, but this was at the heyday, you know, Lafayette was big. And then, you know, the competition started knocking them down with the Radio Shack and the other ones. And then they were gone by the, I guess by the eighties, they were on their way out, but they had so much. Remember, here's another thing I was big in two years ago was rocketry. Here we go. We got the Valkyrie. V the, the, <laughs> now, uh, who, as a kid, rocketry was so much fun. And remember the uh, Renwall, the uh, visible V8 kit? We got it right here. It was 10 bucks, And uh, a telephone amplifier. They had so many things that were so funny when you look back at now. But uh, I've, this catalog was, was it. We used to look through this all the time. These radios. I remember my dad used to have this... Very similar to this radio. He used to wax his car in the backyard, and that would be sitting on the hood as he was waxing the car. And uh, remember, this was AM, FM. These were just before the boom boxes came out. But these were, you would take these to the beach or something, and they and they worked well. You know, they didn't kill the batteries like, uh, like some of the later radios did. And uh, yeah, a Lafayette. This was something. I wonder if you guys remember that. And again, the speakers and hi-fi that my dad was was so into we had everything here you can imagine great catalog great times okay next up i promised i would cover this when i uh, bought this thread file Stuart, my buddy over in australia did a scrounges workshop did a beautiful uh, uh fix on getting his chuck off the lathe and he showed a thread file and i said i would i'd like to uh, go over um how to repair some buggered threads that you might have. And buggered is the pr appropriate word to use when threads are screwed up. Now, we're going to use this piece of all thread or threaded rod um, because it's just kind of a softer thread. It's easy to work with. Now, this is a 3 8 inch by 16 threads per inch. Now, the way to tell it, you can do it two ways. You can count the threads per inch, and there'll be 16 of them. Or you can use uh, a beautiful, this one here is a Starrett screw pitch gauge, but you can get any manufacturing. And this is what it looks like. Has little teeth on here. That's, that's kind of an oil, so it stops it from rusting. But um, here we have, you can see here on the, it's printed in here. You can see it says uh, 16 threads per inch over here. And what you do is you take a white background and you put it over here like this and you run and you could see that it should fit in there just perfect. You see how that goes back and forth just perfect with a white background. Now, what it would look like, I'm going to go to fit. This is 15 threads per inch and you could see how it, it will not match up. You see that? I can't get it to engage. That's how you use a thread pitch gauge to figure out how many threads per inch you're dealing with. And they also have it for metric. Now, I'm going to bugger this up on purpose with a ball peen and let me show you how to how to fix threads. Okay, we gave this a little, couple wraps with a ball peen hammer. You can see we screwed up the threads here. It doesn't take much to screw them up and you can see here if we try and screw this nut down, it'll lock up right here. It won't even make it past the first one. 
um, and now it, it can actually jam up. Now, there's a couple ways you could do this. Now, they have thread, uh, or you can run a die, or what they call a thread chaser, which is a, uh, it's almost like a die, but it's meant to restore it. And a lot of times you could screw that down, but a lot of times you can't get a die on there, or whatever the case, it might be attached to something, or attached at both ends, and you got to fix those threads. Um, here in the States, we use a 60-degree thread, I think they use a 50 degree uh, 50 degree thread over in the UK, but um, what, there's a couple ways you could clean these threads up and fix them up, and I'm going to show you how. First way I'm going to demonstrate is something called a thread file, and you can see here there are numbers on the file corresponding to the teeth per inch. Okay, you can see 20, 24, 13, 14, and here we have 16 and 18. Okay. Now, what you want to do is you want to take, remember we said that this is 16 threads per inch, so you want to use this one here. And how you use this, you put this, we put this into a vise, and especially if you can have it secured, here we have a couple nuts that we could put it in, and we're going to run the 16 part, where it says, that's 13, there we go, the 16 part, we're going to run, and you can see it corresponds nicely with the threads, and we're going to run that across, and that will straighten up the uh the lands and grooves they call it let me show you now what it looks here's like. where your soft jaws come in handy or any two pieces of wood to hold it you don't want to create any more damage so we have that secured into the vise we're taking the 16 threads per inch side of the file we're putting it down here and and you could see we're going to run it it'll find its way you're going to get it in the groove and you can see it locks itself in you know and what you're going to do is you're just going to run this across like this just very gently let the file do the work across the damaged area. We have the damaged area facing up. We're going to run this across a couple times. And that will take off some of that excess uh, bend or, or squash over that we had. And that's all you do with this. But it's important that you get the right one. Now, if you look over here, you can see it's, it's starting to come up. And again, you can always use the nut to test and see how we're doing and how far we have to go. Now you can see over here, we, we take the nut and uh, place it on the end here and see how far. Okay, now you can see we're getting a further down than when we were before. It's not perfectly smooth, but you can see we got a lot further down. Now what we're going to do, again, we'll, t we'll run it through a couple more times until you get this to be nice and smooth. These work great. Try and get one made in the USA if you can, or a good make. Now you see that? Getting down a little bit further. We're down about here. We're having problems. Bring it back and do the same thing. Always making sure you're on the right. There we go. Always making sure you're on the right numbers until you can get it down to where it gets past the bug it up area. Okay? Now, uh, again, we didn't bugger it up too much. You could have probably did it with just the nut running it down. But if you're going to do that, it's always good to put a little cutting fluid or some kind of oil to help it. But you see, we got this to, to work again. And I'll show you what these threads look like close up. Okay, this was the area that was buggered up before. And you could see how we the, the file took off and made this a usable, uh, usable thread again. Now, the next way I'm going to show you is... Uh, this one here, this is called a universal thread repair tool. And I'll show you how this works. This is really interesting. I got this pretty cheap because it was on sale and I wanted to try it out to show it on the channel. But how this works, you could see here, there's two little cutting teeth, two little, like almost two little file teeth. And you would put this on here, screw it down. This will, this is a universal It'll work on all different threads and, and, uh, all different threads per inch or whatever. I think it even works on metric. And you turn this down and then you would just screw it on. And it's like a, uh, or, or turn the screw and it will repair because these have little 60 degree uh, cutters in here and it'll repair the threads. And I've shown this before on the channel, how it works. It actually works very well. This is good for when you, uh, you, you don't really have access that you could take this out and work on it. You know, you could put this on the stud of a car or something. Really nice little unit. They're not cheap now, but it does work. So uh, let me show you one more way. Last up, I want to show you this uh, universal 60 degree thread file. And what it is, it's a file. You can see here, 
that's cut at 60 degrees and how you would use this the same way we did with the multiple flute one this is obviously a better unit but uh this is a single and you would put it in the vise and you would just run it each thread like this back and forth let me show you okay here we go let's say your threads were buggered up here you would take this put it into the uh the area into each one of the grooves and just run it you could hear it taking a cut and this will do the same thing that the other file did but one at a time and you just you start off low as you're pushing you make that semicircle. if the threads bug it up all the way around you might have to turn loosen up your your vice turn it a little bit and do the same thing until you you work it and then you might have to look at it with a magnifying glass just to see how they look you could see if you have something that's overhanging but another good item to have universal thread file 60 degrees lastly i want to show you can use a die if uh if again if you have one um uh, you know sometimes you you have to clean up you have to see what tools you have a die goes into a die holder but you don't have to use a die holder because it's shaped you know you could use a regular wrench but if you notice on the dies it says start this side because a, a what happens is a die is tapered it's like that inside so you want to start it on where it says start this side. That's where you would put it on to your threaded area here. Use a little bit of lubricant and then just work it back and forth like this with your hands. Or you can use a, an, an open end wrench or any kind of wrench. And that will clean up the threads. But, it, you know, it's going to also cut any, uh, like here we have an area that's cut. But work it back and forth until it's super smooth in your hand. And again, it works good with a little bit of lubricant on there, a little bit of cutting fluid or even regular oil. And then uh, pull it back down and uh, you'll see that the nut will, will be much easier on there. Okay, I can't believe that was 17 minutes. Man, do I ramble sometimes. Anyway, I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you again on Monday. Take care now. Bye-bye.